This is Transition Metal Chemistry, Chapter 20, The Metal Complexes, Electronic Structure and Properties. In this chapter, we will cover three main topics, electronic structure, electronic spectra, and then magnetism. We will look at this topic first, electronic structure. It consists of two sections, crystal field theory and ligand field theory. So now let's look at section 20.1. Crystal field theory. In crystal field theory, a ligand lone pair is modeled as a point negative charge that repels electrons in the d orbitals of the transition metal center. So this is completely classical physics. We're not talking about orbital theory here. Now let's look at A, octahedral complexes. So first I want you to look at this five different d orbitals, dz squared, dx squared minus y squared, dzx or dxz, dyz, and dxy. So first, let's look at uh, these two shapes. This dz squared is pointing in the z direction, up and down. dx squared minus y squared, you can see, well, there are four lobes, two on the x direction, and two along the y direction. Uh, what about dxz or dzx? Well, they are pointing kind of between uh, x and z directions. So this is your x direction, and this vertical axis is the z direction. So dzx lies in the xz plane, and then the four lobes are between the z axis and the x-axis. Well, similarly, if you look at this dyz, uh, you have this is the y-axis, this is the z-axis, so this dyz orbital lies uh, in the yz plane. And then if you look at this four lobes, uh, they are between the z-axis and the y-axis. Well, you can tell there are two uh, planar nodal surfaces in this orbital. When y is 0, well, when y is 0, so this is when y is 0, you have a nodal surface. When z is 0, you have another nodal surface. Both are planar nodal surfaces. Uh, and then dxy. So dxy lies in the xy plane, and again, you have four lobes. Uh, these four lobes are between the x-axis and y-axis. So I want you to pay attention to the difference between this dxy and dx squared minus y squared. So again, these two orbitals are described by a wave function proportional to x squared minus y squared or proportional to xy. So in this case, when x is equal to y, you have a planar nodal surface. When x is equal to negative y, you have another nodal plane. Over here, when x is 0, you have a nodal plane. When y is 0, you have another nodal plane. So again, these two uh, look similar, and they both lie in the xy plane, but uh, they have a slightly difference uh, in the position of the nodal surfaces. Okay, now let's get back to this uh, section 1, uh, A octahedral complexes. That means, well, we'll put six ligands near those d orbitals. Top, bottom, left, right, front, back. Top, bottom, left, right, front, back. And same here, all right? Same positions. So by adding the six ligands on these six positions, uh, the symmetry of the free transition metal center is now downgraded from the spherical symmetry, which is a k-point group, to the OH-point group. So the OH-point group, octahedral point group, is still a high symmetry point group, but lower than the spherical symmetry. So again, if you just have a free transition metal center with those 5D orbitals, it has a spherical symmetry that belongs to the k-point group. But now, by adding six ligands on top, bottom, left, right, front, and back, the 
point group is now octahedron. Now again, let's look at this uh, ligands as point charges. So they are just point negative charges. Well, for example, if you have uh, carbon monoxide, six of them bonded to a uh, transition metal center, uh, each carbon monoxide is viewed here in crystal field theory as a point negative charge. All right? Uh, and then we have a uh, negative charge here, negative charge here, and then four negative charges on the XY plan. Now you can see if if we put electrons in the dz squared orbital. So you have electrons here. All right, d electrons here in this dz squared orbital. Uh, those two electrons will be repelled by those two ligands or those two uh, negative charges. So there's a strong repulsion between the two dz squared electrons and the two ligands, one on top, one on the bottom. Uh, what if you put two electrons in the dx squared minus y squared orbitals? Well, again, imagine uh, you have two electrons uh, distributed in these four lobes. There are four lobes here. Uh, they will feel, these two electrons will feel strong repulsion from one, two, three, four. Uh, this four negative point charges. So therefore, there are strong repulsion, and then we'll see this two d orbitals have higher energy than the other three. And in molecular orbital theory, uh, and also in the uh, group theory, you'll see these two will be uh, degenerate. That means uh, there's two orbitals. Uh, both have higher energy than the other three, but they have uh, the same energy. So these two are degenerate. Uh, we're going to say this is a E symmetry. Double, doubly degenerate in group theory. This E means doubly degenerate. And this G means garroter. That means uh, symmetric with respect to the inversion center. So I want you to imagine there's an inversion center here. And this is symmetrical with respect to the inversion center. Same here. Now let's look at dxy, dyz, and dzx, these three orbitals. And imagine you put two electrons in this dxz orbital, or this dyz orbital, or this dxy orbital. And there's still going to be repulsion, for sure, uh, between the two d electrons and the well, in this case, these four point negative charges are closer to the d electrons than these two, all right? But if you look at the distance uh, between this negative point charge and this lobe, it's greater than over here. This is really close because these two lobes are pointing directly to the negative charges. These four lobes are pointing directly to the four negative charges. Over here, well, it's kind of in between, all right? So this distance is certainly greater than this distance. So qualitatively, if you just look at uh, the d orbitals and the negative charges, you'll see the repulsion is smaller between the d electrons and the ligands. Same here and same here. Uh, this one is uh, more clear. Uh, you can see this lobe is in between these two negative charges. So again, if you put one electron here, one electron here, okay, and then you can see, well, the electron here feels less repulsion from these two negative charges than this in this scenario, okay? In this scenario, the four lobes are pointing directly to the four negative point charges. Over here, not directly. It's kind of in between. So the solution... The summary is this. In these three scenarios, if we put electrons in these d orbitals, the electron-electron repulsion between the d electrons and the ligand electrons is smaller than the top two scenarios. And also, these three have uh, the same energy. So we're going to say this is triply degenerate. Uh, in group theory, in the character table for the OH point group, um, we use letter T for triply degenerate. Okay? So again, in group theory, in character tables, E means 
uh, doubly degenerate. T means triply degenerate. Uh, and this G again means greater. That means uh, uh, this D orbitals are symmetrical with respect to uh, the center. Okay, the center is here. And how do you know it's greater or ungrader? Uh, my trick is to just draw an arrow that passes through the center. And then you look at the sign of uh, the two ends of the arrow. So over here, let's say this is uh, negative, and then this is negative. And then you can draw another uh, arrow here, positive, positive. Okay, in this case, I'm just assuming this, this is negative, this is positive. But also, you can just look at the colors. You just look at the colors. You draw an arrow that passes through the center. And then on both ends of the arrow, you have the same color. That means symmetrical with respect to the center. That's garroter. That's garroter. So all those d orbitals are garroter with respect to the center of symmetry. All right, p orbitals are ungarroter. S orbitals are garroter. So now you probably can see the trend. If you look at S, P, D, F, G orbitals, S garroter, P ungarroter. D grader, F un grader, G grader. All right. Uh, two also uh, tells you whether this uh, auto is symmetric or uh, anti-symmetric with respect to a different uh, symmetry operation. Uh, we'll get back to this later when we look at the character table of the OH point group. So again, this DG squared and DX squared minus y squared, they are degenerate. This two are degenerate. So uh, they belong to this uh, E sub G uh, symmetry species. Uh, this three are triply degenerate. Uh, they belong to the T to G symmetry species in the OH point group. Uh, because of the different amount of repulsion, uh, the two EG orbitals fields, Okay, this 2 EG feels greater repulsion than the 3 T2G orbitals. So there's going to be energy splitting. Uh, over here, you see this 5D orbitals uh, degenerate 5D orbitals when you have a free transition metal center. All right? And then you put six ligands around this 5D orbitals on top, bottom, left, right, front, and back. Uh, the point group. Uh, drops from the perfect spherical point group, it's called a K point group, uh, to a octahedral point group. Again, the octahedral point group is still highly symmetric, but I would say less symmetric than a perfect sphere. And now over here, uh, the 5D orbitals split into EG and T2G. You have DXY dyz and dzx on the bottom. You have dz squared and dx squared minus y squared on top. Okay, so this two feels greater electron-electron repulsion from the ligands. Uh, now, quantitatively, we're going to call this uh, the Barry center. So Barry center comes from a uh, Greek word for the center of masses. So we're going to just arbitrarily uh, call this as the center of the energy. All right, and then we want to say, well, the difference between EG and T2G is delta O. O stands for octahedral. Delta means uh, the difference. So that's the energy difference in an oct octahedral complex. So overall, it's delta O. And then uh, we have to make sure uh, this Barry center is the center of energies, all right? And then we have two orbitals above the Barry center, three orbitals below the Barry center. So now if you recall how the center of masses is defined in general physics, you will realize that these three are 0 0.4 or two-fifths delta O below the Barry center. These two are three-fifths or 0 0.6 times delta O above the barycenter. So now if you do a calculation, 2 times positive 3 fifths. Over here, 3 times negative 2 fifths 
right? If you sum it up, you get zero. Two times positive three fifths. Okay, in total, it's I think positive uh, six fifths. Or here, three times negative two fifths. That's negative six fifths. So they cancel. So overall, when we define this as the barycenter or the center of energy, and then we'll see if you sum up the energies of these two orbitals and the energy of these three orbitals relative to the barycenter, you'll get zero. So again, delta O denotes the energy difference between Eg and T2G uh, in this octahedral complex, and O stands for octahedral. Uh, the, the two Eg orbitals are 0 0.6 delta O above the barycenter, and then the T2G orbitals are uh, 0 0.2 delta O uh, below the barycenter. So I want to tell you uh, why this is 0 0.6 and this is 0 0.4. Uh, delta O is, again, the uh, crystal field splitting parameter. So how much the d orbitals are split of an octahedral complex. Pay attention to this O. And later you will see uh, for a tetrahedral complex, it's going to be called delta T. So this depends on the ligands, uh, the identity of the metal, and the charges of the metal. So this delta O is not going to be the same uh, for different transition metal complexes. Uh, how much this d orbitals are split it depends on the nature of the ligands, the identity of the metal, and also the charge of the metal. So we're going to talk about the ligand effects um, and how the identity of the metal affects the splitting. For example, 3D, 4D, 5D elements are going to be different. And also the charges of the metal also have a significant effect to this delta O. But first, ligand effect. Uh, this is very difficult to understand because there are multiple factors uh, resulting uh, from the uh, interpretation of the interaction between the orbitals of the ligands and the transition metal center. So this crystal field theory treats those ligands as point charges. Uh, it's not going to be enough to explain the ligand effect. So you'll have to wait until section two, the ligand field theory, to fully understand the ligand effect. But for now, uh, I'm going to just show you the trend. Uh, carbon monoxide has the strongest uh, ligand effect in this series. So this carbon monoxide, when six of them are bonded to a transition metal center in an octahedral complex, the delta O is going to be very significant, more significant than all other ligands. All right, so this cyanato is number two, and then this is triphenylphosphenol ligand, and over here this is a uh, nitrito ligand, and with underscore n, this means nitrito kappa n. The nitrogen is the point of attachment. You will see the same ligand here the nitrito ligand, but this is nitrito kappa O. All right, so it does depend on uh, which atom is the point of attachment. All right, and then you have phenyl, you have bipyramidal, you have, this is actually one, two, diamino, ethane, ammonia, pyridine, uh, methyl cyanide, etc., etc. Cyano, uh, cyanidal with nitrogen as the point of attachment. So you have to say uh, thio cyanido kappa n, okay, kappa n, over here kappa s, all right, it depends. And then you have water, you have oxido, et cetera, et cetera. It seems that it's hard to find any rules uh, for this, uh, but later you will learn in section two, ligand field theory, there are rules, there are rules. For now, I can just uh, briefly um, introduce some of the reasons uh, very superficially. Uh, in general, ligands that have p electrons uh, to donate to the uh, empty d orbitals of the metal uh, have a smaller delta O. Uh, for example, uh, bromido chloride. All right, uh, bromido here, chloride here, or also aldehyde. So other than the two electrons, 
that become the bonding electrons between, uh, for example, this uh, iodide ligand and the transmetal center. Uh, this iodide has uh, three more lone pair electrons, all right? And they can be donated to the empty d orbitals of the transition metal as well. And uh, that uh, actually reduces delta O, reduces the crystal field splitting parameter here. All right? So again, we'll explain this uh, with uh, molecular orbital theory in section two. In section two. So for now, it explains to you uh, this fluorine minus, chlorine minus, uh, bromido, aldido, uh, they have additional lone pair p electrons that can be donated to the empty d orbitals of the transition metal, uh, and this effect lowers this delta O. All right. Uh, and then uh, ligands that have empty p orbitals, d orbitals or pi star orbitals, that can accept electrons from the d orbitals of the transition metal. They have a larger splitting, uh, a larger delta O. Uh, they are called a strong field ligands. All right, so uh, I'm going to give you also a few examples. Carbon monoxide. We know there's a triple bond in carbon monoxide. There's a, a triple bond in this cyanide ion. Uh, when they become ligands in a transition metal complexes, uh, we call this carbonyl ligand. We call this cyanidal ligand. Uh, not only they have pi orbitals, they have also pi star orbitals. So remember when two uh, p orbitals interact with each other, you form two MOs, one pi bonding MO, the other pi star anti-bonding MO. So don't forget that in this uh, carbonyl ligand and cyanidal ligand, you have pi star orbitals. Okay, and the pi star orbitals can accept the D electrons from the transition metal center. All right, in those cases, uh, you have a very large delta O. Okay, and it's called a strong field ligand. So now uh, we have these two types of ligands. Uh, iodido and bromido, they can donate p electrons to the transition metal. And over here, uh, Co and Cn minus, they have empty pi star orbitals, can accept d electrons from the transition metal. So in this case, we have weak field ligand with small delta O. In this case, we have strong field ligand with large delta O. Now let's look at uh, the numbers. Delta O, in this case, weak field ligand, it's roughly 10,000 centimeters. Uh, wave numbers, uh, strong field ligand, delta O is 30,000 wave numbers. So uh, you may find the use of wave numbers here. One wave number is one per centimeter here. You may find the use of this unit strength. Uh, but um, in uh, transition metal chemistry, uh, we often take uh, the infrared spectra of the transition metal complexes and you learned that uh, you learned in organic chemistry when you look at the infrared spectra uh, the unit being used uh, in the horizontal axis is wave number one wave number is uh, one wave per centimeter so over here uh, 10,000 wave numbers means we can uh, align 10,000 waves together in uh, a one centimeter distance. So I would say each wave has a wavelength of uh, 10 to the power of negative four uh, centimeters. And 10 to the power of negative four centimeters uh, is um, um, 1,000 nanometers. So that's why you can convert it to lambda. And also, given these two numbers, I think you can easily compute uh, the energy in joule by using this equation. It's uh, hc over lambda. Okay, so it's uh, the Planck constant times the speed of light times uh, the wave number. Uh, but pay attention to the units. Make sure you use, when you do the calculation, uh, you use uh, a consistent set of units. So for example, just use SI units 
In that case, the Planck constant is uh, 6.6 .6 times 10 to the power of negative 34 joule second. Uh, the speed of law of flight is 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meter per second. And over here, uh, you need to convert this number to 10 to the power of 6 uh, meter to the power of negative 1. All right, so if you can put 10,000 waves within one centimeter, you can put one, uh, one thousand, uh, that one million. You can put one million uh, waves within one meter. So this is equivalent to uh, one million per meter. All right, so this is 10,000, but if you have carbonyl or CM minus, that has pi star empty orbitals to accept d electrons, delta O, is often as large as 30,000 uh, wave numbers. So we have a smaller lambda and we have a higher energy here. Again, it's H times C times uh, this uh, wave number. Okay, so in this case, this uh, delta O is roughly three times this delta O. Now, what if you have a ligand that cannot donate P electrons to the transition metal? And it does not have pi star orbitals to accept electrons uh, from the transient metal. Uh, for example, ammonia, that's in the metal. And in this case, delta O is in between. It's between 10,000 and 30,000, so it's roughly 20,000 wave numbers. And lambda is uh, 500 nanometers. And when you have a wavelength of 500 nanometers, uh, this is uh, uh, in the visible range. This is in the visible range. All right, so... <laughs> I want to tell you something more really qualitative. So uh, very often, if you have iodide or bromide as the ligand, um, the transition metal complex is often colorless because they tend to absorb infrared light. It's not going to change your perception of the color of this transition metal complex. But then if you have um, this uh, carbonyl or cyanide ligands, but still, it's colorless because this kind of uh, uh, transverse metal complexes tend to absorb UV, UV light. Of course, there's going to be exceptions. I'm going to just talk about the um, photon absorption to promote an electron from the lower energy T2G orbitals to higher energy uh, EG orbitals. And in that case, you need a UV light, but again, UV light is invisible. Therefore, you don't see color from the uh, excitation of electrons from the lower T2G orbitals to the higher EG orbitals. But in this case, if you have ammonia or water, those kind of ligands, very likely your transition metal complex uh, looks colorful, really beautiful colors. Uh, this is because delta O is roughly 20,000 centimeters. That corresponds to a wave number of 500 nanometers. Okay, again, this is um, a, a semi-quantitative estimate. So when I say 500, it can be from 300 to 800. You know, it's just uh, actually a wide range, a wide range around 500 nanometers. But this wide range mostly uh, is in the visible range. That's why when you have ammonia ligands, water ligands, which does not have P electrons to donate, and they do not have empty P orbitals, D orbitals, or pi star antibody orbitals to accept D electrons, uh, they tend to be colorful. All right, and then we'll talk about the metals. We'll talk about metals. Uh, the identity of the metals also affects delta O. So it's not just like, you know, you just look at the ligands and then, you know, it's going to be 10,000, 20,000, or 30,000. You still need to look at the metals, all right? So if you have a 3D versus 4D versus 5D uh, transition metal elements, they have different delta O's, even if the ligands are the same. Uh, why is that? Well, 5D orbitals are more diffuse than 4D orbitals. 4D orbitals are more diffuse than the 3D orbitals. So 5D orbitals can overlap with the ligands better than 4D orbitals. 4D can overlap with the ligands better than 3D orbitals. 
So when you have a 5D transition metal center, delta O is greater uh, than that from the interaction between 4D and the ligands, and then uh, greater than the interaction between 3D and the ligands. So again, if you have a, a heavier transition metal, a 5D transition metal, uh, you expect to see a greater delta O than 4D, and 4D is greater than 3D. Uh, now let me give you a, um, a series here. So you can see uh, some of those transition metal centers are enclosed in this uh, uh, red curly parentheses. Some are in green, some are in purple. So I want you to look at the periodic table. And you will realize uh, those transition metals in the red curly parentheses, they are all 3D elements. Okay, so within this green curly parentheses, this four are 4D elements, and this two are 5D, right? This two are 5D. So again, this two will have the largest delta O because. Uh, their 5D orbitals are more diffuse. Uh, they can reach further. They overlap with the ligands more than the 4D or 3D elements. That means the interaction between the transition metal center is stronger. Okay, so and then you have a larger delta O. Okay, 3D orbitals are tighter. They're close to the transition metal nucleus. Uh, they do not fetch as far as 4Ds or 5Ds. So the interaction between the 3D orbitals and the ligands is smaller. That's why the splitting is also smaller. There's smaller interaction, there's smaller splitting. Of course, if there's no interaction between the transitory metal center and the ligands, then there's zero delta O. There's no splitting. Uh, the oxidation number of the transition metal also matters. Uh, the larger the oxidation number, you can imagine uh, the larger positive charges are centered on the transition metal center. And then if you have a larger positive charge on the transition metal center, it attracts the ligands more. And then there's a stronger interaction between the transition metal center and the ligands. Now let's look at a few examples. So again, these two are 5D elements, but this is 4 plus, this is only 3 plus. So 4 plus has a larger delta O than 3 plus. Now let's look at the 4D elements. This is 4 plus. The delta O for this 4 plus transition metal center is greater than the 3 pluses. Okay, over here, 3 plus, 3 plus. They have a larger delta O than 2 plus, 2 plus, 2 plus, 2 plus, 2 plus. All right? So we can clearly see the larger the oxidation number on the transition metal, the larger the delta O. So we talked about three different effects, the ligand effects. Uh, if the ligand can donate the P electrons, you have a smaller delta O. If the ligands have empty pi star orbitals. To accept the electrons, you have large delta O. Uh, what if you have neither p electrons to donate, nor empty PD or pi star orbitals to accept the electrons, and then it's in the middle. So these three are the ligand effects. And then there's a effect uh, that uh, tells you 5D Transition metal elements has larger delta O than 4D than 3D. Because 5D orbitals are more diffuse, they can overlap with the ligands better than 4D than 3D. The interaction between 5D elements and ligands is stronger than those between 4D and the ligands than 3D and the ligands. Finally, the oxidation number. Uh, this is more obvious than the previous two effects. Uh, if you have a very large positive charge on the transition metal center, there's going to be a stronger interaction between the transition metal and the ligand.